Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. Our topic today is mental fitness, and I'm joined by two of our experts from Central Ohio, Captain Rob Cloud from Prairie Township Fire Department and Lieutenant Dave Gerald from Columbus Fire Department to talk about mental fitness. Thank you both for being here. Doc, thanks for having us. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, topic very near and dear to my heart. So thanks again. And thank you, Doc, for uh, having us and sharing such important information and uh, certainly appreciate and honored to uh, be part of this. Of course. Yeah, this is really a change of pace from a lot of our clinical content that we've had during EMS week this year. Uh, but this is a very important topic. Uh, this is dealing with our providers. This is dealing with our, uh, our uh, friends and our loved ones and our work families. Uh, so this is um, this is very important, and uh, we're excited to have you both. I'd like to just get started right away. And typically what we do is we present a case, and then we hand it over to our experts to uh, share their knowledge and expertise. So I'm going to start with a case that uh, could happen at any fire department, any EMS agency, and I'll hand it over to you guys. So let's just uh, imagine that our department was involved in a pediatric gunshot wound that ended up arresting en route to the hospital and the, and the patient ended up dying. And um, everything clinically has happened. And now we are, uh, after we've given off care to the, to the hospital and to the ED, what, what happens? How do, we, how do we address our colleagues? How do we lead our EMS agencies in dealing with a traumatic event like this? Right, so I'd say uh, it, it very soon after that event, after the, the patient's been transferred to the ED from the pre-hospital side, what I would say is just take a minute, uh, medic crews, engine crews, anybody supporting the, the treatment of that patient to just take a second, take a breath and, and acknowledge what happened and the, uh, the impact of that event that it may have had on some of the crew. So just a stop and pause, maybe at the ED, or maybe as you're rolling in back into the station to resupply. So just a quick pause and recognition. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with Dave. Uh, this was one of the things uh, sitting in and having the honor to sit through Dave, several of Dave's classes down at Columbus Fire uh, have been very powerful for our department. Uh, I've initiated the pause just within my unit and it doesn't have to for say just be a pediatric run. It's just any uh, any human life that we've had loss, uh, whether we're at the house on a, on a DOA or somebody that we've transported, um, we have found that very powerful and impactful. Um, we, we just take a pause. It's not a, it's not a religious movement. It's not uh, anything more than this was a human life and we want to recognize it. Um, also, it's a time for us to talk about uh, just before is, you know, is there anything else anybody can think about? Um, we've seen uh, our local ER do it on several of their patients and we saw how packful it was. So between uh, Dave and, and the hospital staff already implementing it, uh, it really did a lot. And I know the first couple of times I, I conducted this uh, process, uh, my crew, when we got back just individually, not as a whole crew, but just individually said, Hey, uh, Cap, that, that was really amazing. Thank you so much. And um, one time we, we involved, it was uh, the, the patient's friend. He had expired. He had died there at home, and his friend found him. And we actually had his friend in for the pause, and uh, he was just so, so overwhelmed at what we were doing. So it's just a little thing. I, I know it's been around for a little while, but it's new to, I, I know for me, that was the first time I ever heard it when I watched Dave's class, but uh, I like the pause. It definitely gets uh, that end, uh, that end of life. And, and let's just recognize that this was a human life. You think about how we do it. We pick up all our kits. We clean up our, we walk out. One person goes out and talks to the family. They're going to wait on law enforcement to be there. And when you really sit back and look at it after that pause presentation, you're like, wow, that, that's uh, that, that can be an insensitive view from, from so many different angles. So um I know for our my my people, it's it's been very powerful, and I am truly blessed that I learned to do that, and and we've implemented it. What is the significance yeah. of the timing of the stop and pause? Does it have to be? Is it more effective the closer it is to the incident, or it, 
is, is, is there a need to do it right away or can it wait, for example, till you get back to the station or uh, at, at a later time throughout the shift? I think what Captain Cloud's talking about can be uh, the, the sooner it happens near to the patient can be the most effective way. Um, when it's appropriate, when you look around the room and go, okay, this is the time and it's appropriate. Sometimes it may not be, but oftentimes it is. And the, the reason for that is it can help us take that emotional energy in, that's on that run that we hold during that run and lets us just put it down right there. And we can walk away a little bit easier and get back to the normal routine of providing care a little bit sooner. Uh, that's the goal of, of that pause. And when it can happen near to the patient, that's great. If, if you take a second, you know, uh, sooner the better. Yeah, I agree with Dave on this. Um, but, you know, I, I also, as Dave was talking and mentioning, the awareness of your environment dictate where and when you do it but uh, it is much better we'll do it right there in the room if no you know if there's no family that's fine even better we just we just do it as a as a crew and um, I think the more powerful movement is if somebody does not want to do it you may have uh, somebody on your crew that you know hey I'll be out at the truck I'm just going to leave the truck and I, and I think a good angle as a leader uh, anybody out there wanting to do this is talk to that person back at the station and, and let them realize that, you know, I, I realize this may not be something that you would like to do, but we are one team. And, and if you would, I just really appreciate it. If you just stand there for your crew member, uh, you know, the person you spend a third of your life with, uh, it's easy to easy for us to say that we don't have to say much more after we just say, just be there for our team. Will you, I, I you don't, you know, I just want you to stand there and just be with our team and, and be with the people that, that need this. hundred percent agree. Cause some people may be uh, reluctant to buy in, but just using that language, Hey, would you be there to support the rest of the team? Uh, we're mm -hmm. fixers by nature. So that can get the whole team uh, on the same page for sure. Thanks Rob. You know, then moving forward, you know, phase two of that looks like maybe an hour an hour after the event, you're back at the station, you're away from the scene, you're away from the ER, the ED, you're back in your safe space at your station. So for pre-hospital, that might look like grabbing um, uh, some food, some refreshment, something to get you recharged, mark yourself out of service, mm -hmm. and do an emotional decon, and just do a little debrief with the crew, I'm sorry, defuse. Uh, a little mm -hmm. diffusing with the crew and you can use trained peers for that but i know not a lot of agencies have that but if you do invite your peer team in and do a little diffusing and just talk about the emotional impact of that run you know so that's like second step absolutely okay. on dave go ahead doc sorry i was just going to ask for just for clarification about what you mean by the term diffuse Mm -hmm. So, sure, uh, diffuse is a term that we use in the critical incident stress community. And diffuse means to do a uh, early intervention that's very informal, very light, and just acknowledges the event and gives people a chance to share lightly what uh, may be on their mind in the, in the hour or two after the event occurred. So yeah, diffusing... Um, a, you hear diffusing and debriefing. I keep it straight because diffusing has an F in it and that happens first. Got it. And, and also too, Doc, I think that keeps us away from the tactical part of it, uh, of already trying to, hey, let's talk about what went wrong on the run. Let's talk about, this isn't that time. Diffusion is not time for talking about, hey, what did we do wrong? How do we fix it? Let's identify some uh, some inadequacies during the run or whatever it is, that's not the time. Um, in this diffusion also, it really helps. Uh, it's not beneficial at all to go back to the station and go one by one and one on one with anybody and say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And then if I identify one person, I'm just going to talk to that one person. This diffusion and taking everybody um, out of service in our in our the department will take them out of service in a, in a direct run as you're talking about this incident, uh, this instant that we would take them out of service. Uh, maybe we bring in overtime. Maybe we have a call in list, but you have to have a process. Who do we call? We know who we're going to call. Um, 
we call them in to sit and talk. If they don't feel they want to sit and talk, that's okay. They're still in the room. Uh, but also it, op- it has some open dialogue with folks that normally may not uh, come out and talk about this whatsoever. And as Dave has always said, you know, it had, we all went through the same event, the same smells, the same sights, the same sounds. We did everything together. It was an event we shared. And it gives that opportunity for people to speak up or, or just have that moment of taking care of the emotion side. Nothing tactical. Don't bring tacticals into diffusion. Just talk and be there together. Spot, that's spot on, Rob. That's ideally how it would go down, you know, in, in back at the station in, in that next hour or two after the event. Right on. What are some tips for an individual that would be responsible for leading that at the station, like a house captain or a house lieutenant? Uh, great question. So uh, someone in charge of a crew, um, you know, own it and be the leader and normalize the behavior that we all have as humans. Uh, often we lose we can get lost in our identity and say, well, we're the fixers and we help people and we're not supposed to feel the feelings. But at the end of the day, we're all humans. So a, a captain, a lieutenant, a supervisor can uh, normalize that situation and I don't want to say make it mandatory, but make it part of the culture mm-hmm. where, well, that's, that's what we do at this agency is we take care of our people and taking care of our people means having a diffusing after an emotionally charged run. Yeah. And Doc, the, I, I think one of the greatest assets as a leader is, is humility. And having that informal leader that comes up, and you may be that strong-willed officer or leader in your in your division, department, crew, whatever it is that you lead, and you may say, no, we're good, we're fine. He's fine, she's fine, everything will be fine. That informal leader is giving you a very, very loud and an emotional cue of we need to take a break. And I think that's where the humility as a leader says, you know, you're right. I, thank you. It's something I didn't notice. I, I was away from the run or I, I was on another truck. And so I didn't go to the hospital and see what happened. Uh, I, I think listening to your own people as a leader is going to help you identify, hey, let's take ourselves out of service. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. And, and let's get this taken care of. Right. It's something that can help build uh, that relationship from supervisor to crew is you have to build a relationship prior to that bad day. So you can only uh, you got to build that trust first and you can only challenge your crew and get them to buy into your culture is if you built the trust previously. So, you know, a little bit of work ahead of time or a lot of work, actually. Thank you. So what are the next steps following the, um, the, the, you know, so we've had the run, we stopped and paused um, immediately after the run as soon as possible. And now an hour or so later, like you said, we're at the station and we're in the diffuse phase. Now what happens? Right. So in central Ohio, most of us work the 24, 48 shift. So um, there's a good necessary time of, you know what, go to your place go home, do whatever you do on your day or two days off and, you know, give yourself permission to process whatever's going on for you. And during that diffusing, what we'll do is we'll, we'll say, well, here's what you might expect over the next two days while you're off. And some of those things include waves of emotion. It could be sadness, anger, guilt, you know, and it's different for every person, but know that these things could be coming. And the best thing that you can do is let them come and not try to stuff them back. So you're on your own, you're on your own for a couple of days. And that's for good reason, because you need time to process it. Mm -hmm. So you move from that emotional reactive phase into, you know, when you come back to work, you're should be in the cognitive phase then. And and we'll go into that next, but Rob, you want to talk about that time away? Yeah. And before we talk about the time away, I think it's important too, for any of the administrators that, uh, you know, chime in on, on this talk is, is to understand, and, and I'm sure Dave could provide a multitude of statistics downstream. And, and you know, when we have 
uh, co-workers, suicide co-work, uh, or people with addictions. And, and we keep saying to ourselves, what could we have done? What could we have done? And, and this is one of those things right here. Uh, figuring out how do we let that person go home and get them replaced? I, I, you know, it's an overtime issue. It's a manpower issue. We're already stricken to manpower. And the only thing I can say is uh, find a way. Think outside the box. There's ways of doing things. And think outside that box as an administrator. And, and don't take uh, don't think things that are saying lightly. Um, and certainly what Dave is providing is paramount that we have to do. This is what you do. When people, after it already happens, what could we have done? This is prevention right here. And, and uh, so that's the first talk. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And uh, there are some who in this moment might think, oh, Dave might be pretending to not be well so he can get some time off or faking it or faking some post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress. Well, I can tell you with great assurance that people don't fake being hurt. What happens is they fake being okay. And that's dangerous because we put on a mask and we come to work and inside we're, we're dying. So I just want to like put that little blurb out there. Like people, they'll pretend they're not pretending, but by not acknowledging it, like you said, Rob, and taking everybody at their word, that's prevention, 100%. And Dave and I will definitely uh, attest that we're not sitting here uh, with you, Dr. Cortez, because we learned this, we lived it. <laughs> so, yeah. ask, ask me how I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, that couple days, I, I really like what Dave said. I know for me, some of my roller coasters and, and things that I was was family. Uh, that was I, I love what Dave said. Go to your safe place. Give people time to go to their safe place. And if they don't have that safe place, you know, see what you can do for them. Uh, ask them what they need. Um, some of them may want to stay at work. Um, and, and that's something you got to just know your people. I, th I think they, they've hit it right on the head of trust your people, know your people. But that, that several days off, um, let, let them go through those emotions. It, it's okay to hurt. It's okay to, uh, I, I think you're obviously going to feel guilt because we're, we're in the job of fixing people. And, and when we can't do that, uh, we feel inadequate. We feel guilt. Uh, we feel incompetent. Uh, maybe uh, a lesser of a team member, and just understand that you're not. You're not. I, I always use the adage of, and I know this is, is a poor one, but you know, people that work on an assembly line and and they uh, pick the bad beer bottles out. Guess what's going to happen every once in a while? They're going to break one. And 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 I, I know that's really kind of off the wall, but. For me, it just brings it back to uh, real life. This is a job I chose, and I know that in my job, uh, there's good, there's going to be hurt, and it's okay that it's and it's not my fault uh, if those things happen. But having those two or three days, just with family, and certainly open up. Uh, I, I don't know how to say this. It's really hard for some folks because they'll say, "Hey, you know, I don't take that home. My wife shouldn't have to live through this." My, they're living through it. They are living through it, whether you're going to share what happened or you're going to bottle it up and find it in an addiction. They're going to live it. Don't feel that you can't talk to a family member, a friend, a clergy, a co-worker about, hey, I had this. Can I talk to you for a couple minutes? And I just I just need somebody to listen. Yeah, that's great, Rob. That actually brings up another point. Uh, so after the diffusing, you go home. Sometimes you want to share with your spouse, your loved one, uh, perhaps kids. Uh, and sometimes you don't. So I would have some language prepared so that if you come home a little uh, angry, sad, whatever the, that emotion is for you, have some language prepared to say, hey, I just came home. I, I had a difficult run for me tonight. Yeah. I'll talk about it when I'm ready, but I'm not ready right now. Well, now I've just communicated to my spouse that she's she's with me. I'm just not ready to talk about it, and she doesn't feel left out. That that's how it works for me, and I I try to share that advice for others. Like, it's okay, but sometimes the spouse wants to help us, and we're not ready to be helped yet. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. Great advice. Yep. 
Uh, so yeah, so that's two days off. Um, should there be a need, and this is where um, it's the gray area, come back to duty on your next unit day, if it's appropriate, that's when we would do the full formal debriefing. And that's a more formal process. We'd bring in a mental health professional with some peers and take a deep dive into the, the reactions and, and the event. Um, it's appropriate sometimes and not appropriate sometimes, but you collectively as a crew, you'll have to decide, do we want to go to that level? Uh, no right or wrong answer. Yeah. Lieutenant is, is, so we come back to that next duty day and, um, is this where the cognitive phase begins? Have we separated the reactive from the cognitive phase yet? Yeah, it actually, um, if, if we went forward with the debriefing, we would actually, it would transition right in that hour, hour and a half when we're going through the seven steps. I you, see. You, we start, we start with reactive. We kind of go down to the, the, the valley and then it comes back out on a, on a high in the cognitive phase. That's, that's the like brief outline of a debriefing. Uh, and sometimes folks do that on their own two days. Like they're like, okay, we don't need that. Totally appropriate. Um, like I said, no right or wrong answer. And for us, I know sometimes we, you may, may even make it informal, but uh, still, you know, as we have in the past where, you know, I know Dr. Cortez, you, you uh, had been involved that, you know, Hey, let's just have some other folks that were involved. Some of the ER staff, let's get together and have a luncheon and, and have just open dialogue. And, and it was, a, it, you know, when we do that, that was, it's just an amazing feeling. You don't realize how close um, your EMS oil person are with, with the hospital staff and, and maybe that ripple effect of who all was involved and just have something informal, just to, to still just talk about it and, and, like like Dave said, you know, you, you can get into talking some more about what happened, you know, what happened and, and, and sharing that. Yeah, there's great power when people get together and talk about their shared experience. Um, the, the power is in the group. And when you feel safe to talk about it in your own tribe, whatever that is, and sometimes our tribe is our station. And sometimes it expands out to the providers at the hospital because we all work together. We're all mm -hmm. uh, in the same community. Uh, great power in getting the, those folks together. So like uh, Rob did, uh, brought together the pre-hospital and the hospital providers for the some follow-up afterwards, and I thought that was highly effective. How do you guys recommend approaching, you know, individuals that may want to take a more personal approach to this reflection, you know, rather than, you know, sit and, and uh, you know, sit with your, uh, you know, with your coworkers, uh, or um, whoever that may be, you know, what if they prefer to maybe go for a walk on a trail and just sure. be, be alone? There's different personality yeah. types, of course. <laughs> so how do you... I'll, I'll let Dave take this one, but what the, what the personality I have found that wants to do that is anger. That is a person that's not easy uh, in, in a lot of realms, possibly, or it just triggered something. So I'll let, definitely let Dave take this, but for me as a leader, just be ready for one person that is just that's still frustrated, anger, mad, uh, and, and just really uh, needs more emotional support. But uh, Dave definitely has this one. Yeah, so uh, Rob, spot on. Uh, if members are reluctant to engage with the group, that's okay. You know what, we all grieve differently. We all process differently and that's fine. But what I would do is take a very close watch on that member and have some one-on-one -on -one with them who th that person might trust or they do trust, whoever that is for that person. So maybe it's the officer, maybe it's a friend, but like get some dialogue going with that person. And taking a walk honestly is a great way to de-stress. There's so much science behind that. It's, it's bilateral stimulation, it's forward movement, it's rhythm, it's regulation. That's all, all things that we need to calm ourselves emotionally. Um, so that's, that's why we pace when we're anxious, <laughs> is one reason. Because <laughs> our brain tells us to do it, because that's what we need, right? Uh, but anger, but there's a lot of layers. So anger, if you wanna take a deep dive on this, anger, 
can be broken down and it's really fear and sadness. Uh, anger is the emotion that we see that comes out, but what's behind anger is I'm afraid about something or I'm sad about something and I'm just not ready to deal with it yet. And it comes out as anger. Okay. Did that answer your question, doc, about the, the reluctant member? I want to make sure uh, yeah, I get back to that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So were you guys able to walk me through more of this cognitive phase? What does that debrief look like on, on that next duty day? And, you know, Lieutenant, you had mentioned, you know, like a peak in a valley. Can you go into that a bit more? Yeah. So if we went through the true formal process, we'd have a mental health provider that would guide us through certain steps along with uh, trained peers that are trained in this process. And we'd kind of do a, a around the room shares. Um, nobody's made to share, but they would share what's appropriate for them if they want to. And we would ask a question like, well, what was the what was your first reaction? And then the second phase might look like. What was the worst thing for you? You know, and that's kind of the deep dive. And that can really be difficult to talk about. Um, you know, so we kind of work up to that. What was the worst thing for you? And once I found that once people unload and verbally express what the worst thing was, it's like a weight can be lifted because you don't have to hold that in anymore. You don't have to carry the guilt or shame or whatever you might be uh, feeling inside, but you express it like, okay, it's out there. You don't have to you don't have to wear that anymore and it can be very healing so that's the that's the valley or yeah that's the valley and then it transitions the cognitive it's like okay well what now what am i doing in my next what's my next step for me uh getting getting re-engaged to a normal life it's like you're going back to your normal everyday life mm -hmm. um I don't feel like I'm explaining that right, but uh, no, you're, it's, no, it's, Dave. I, I think you are because I, I think it's some. Of, I think what's helping should help people is you're also pointing out the things not to say. Stay away from. If you notice what Dave is doing, it's all personal. It's all emotional. It's all how you're thinking and feeling. It's not. Well, what do you think went well? I've been in a ton of those where, it, and then it goes bad. Yeah, or, okay, well, let's just talk about what went well, because as a leader, you may feel like, oh, let's just talk about the positives because the negatives are, there's too many. And so we know we got to stay away from that. Notice, I think the biggest thing that everybody's, the takeaway from what Dave is, is trying to teach here is just stay with the emotions. You know, I, you know, how are you doing? You know, what, how do we go from here? You know, he's staying, if you notice, it's very personal, it's very emotional, and he's staying with that. Uh, but I, I think that's where it moves into that cognitive uh, because you're, you're really getting them to think, okay, wow, okay, so I, I'm kind of the feelings are over with now, but yeah, where do I, what direction is there now? But I, I just want to point out, going back and thinking to talk about what went well, what went bad, how can we in, get better? We're still down the road from that. Yeah, so we're in that reactive phase. Um, we come out of that uh, meeting in the cognitive phase thinking, what is, what's tomorrow look like? What am I going to do? What's my plan uh, mm -hmm. just for getting back to normal? And then you'll go home, you'll work your shift, go home for two more duty days, and then do the tactics six days after because there are mm -hmm. lessons to be learned. But yeah. after you've had you know five or six days to process the emotions of the run, it's hard to learn about airway management when you're still thinking about um, the emotion of the run. You're, you're not in a learning. It's not a teachable moment. So well, six days later is a better time to talk about airway management and tactics and, and what went right and what went wrong. hundred percent. And, and I think that's also that wonderful time w window that gets all the facts a little bit better and, and gets somebody else looking at it, a medical director involved in reviewing the run report and giving good feedback. Cause something I may have felt that didn't go very good cause I'm very mad and I'm emotional right now, as Dave already said, it's because I'm sad, but I just want to blame somebody. So I may look at that intubation should have never taken that long when in reality, we wait six days later and, and they were only, you know, they were within the normal time limits and doctor medical director comes back with going, I thought it was great. I thought they did a great job. And you're like, wait a minute. That's not, that's the time six days later that you can cognitively, you can really process that and say, 
wow, yeah, here's the facts, man. I, you know what? It felt a whole lot longer on the run, and, and it really felt that that was something that held us up. But I, I just never realized it only took that amount of time. And, uh, you know, so the doc, doc's good with it, and, and so I'm good with it. So I, I think that that's huge on waiting for that tactics because I don't think it's all emotion. It's all feeling. There's no we're going to ignore the facts. And that's where we can get into some trouble. Right. We start. We, yeah, we start taking those uncertainties and we want to fill in the gaps right away as soon as we can. And really, it'd be better if we wait a few days and get the facts. And that could be helpful. And that's really hard because we want answers. <laughs> we're, we're all built that way, right? Uh, so it, it's, it's much harder for people in this field. It just is. And, and I think that that's why these conversations haven't happened. And that's why I think this, this class right here is so unique that we're, we're talking about those things. And, and hopefully folks take this to heart and understand that this could be a reason uh, somebody could go down the wrong path if, if we don't have direction. Yep. Do you find as uh, officers and leaders of your organizations, you know, waiting six days to talk about the operations or the clinical care or X, Y, or Z, the logistics, right? Um, sometimes there's runs where bad stuff just happens and there's not mm -hmm. much that we could do versus a run where maybe there's some uncertainty about our decision making or we maybe missed a procedure or you, you know, there's different types of runs. And do you have any advice for officers that if they have a crew member or crew members that, you know, if they're questioning what they did or questioning, you know, the care that was done, do you have any advice for uh, getting them to pause for six days before we get into that as as a deep dive? Like, do you, uh, do you no, find that situation challenging? Yeah, there's no hard and fast rule. In fact, it always comes up sooner than six days. Of course it does. Uh, but if you can fend it off for a little bit, that can be helpful. I guess that's the takeaway. Uh, fend it off until it's appropriate to talk about it. Is six days too long? Perhaps. Perhaps. Um, well, I, I, I think do it in the right so, order. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you, you know, I, I think that that's something if you already have a process, you have to have a process in place. Uh, you, you can't. You, you know, if somebody has a tract of, of substandard performance or had substandard performance, you have to identify and fix that. And hopefully you have already had an instrument in your program like performance improvement plans and, and having a medical director involved and, and identifying how can we fix this? It, it, has this been an issue? But I still say you still let them know, hey, let's just deal with the, the tragedy right now, let's deal with the emotion right now. Yes, we know there were some mistakes made on the run. We are going to address those. And and here's the biggest thing is that you do address those, right? It, it's the ones where you wait six days and then it just falls off as if it never occurred. There were no mistakes made because we see it's too sensitive of a, of a topic. And lo and behold, down the road, that same mistake happens again. And, and I call those predictable surprises. Right. We, we, we didn't do anything the first time, so it, it, it's, it may happen again. So, uh, Doc, I think I think departments and divisions and, and whatever you're connected with or wherever you work, you have to have that instrument in there and make it established and make it a, an affirmative. Hey, we've got to get this performance improvement. It's not discipline. It's we just need a different performance. But let's we'll deal with that when we get the medical director involved. And we look at all the facts. You know, we won't move on this when we're still dealing with some emotion because it, uh, of the magnitude of the run. Thank you. You, you know, uh, as a follow-up question, um, when I talked to you both about doing this talk for us, you know, I was unsure of what to call it and you suggested mental fitness, right? So yeah. what's the difference between, <laughs> I guess, two-part question. So what's the difference between mental fitness and like critical incident stress management and then a follow up to that is how does this fit into the kind of the paradigm of workplace wellness and being prepared to be mentally fit once you encounter a stressful situation? Doc, thanks for teeing off the, the greatest talk <laughs> ever that's going to occur about mental that's fitness. <laughs> um, I like to call it mental fitness because it draws to what we already know is important in our lives and 
and that's physical fitness, right? Like we're coached in that from elementary school all the way up through high school, college. And like, we know that physical fitness is important. Why is it important? Because we need to be strong, flexible. We have to have great endurance in our physical bodies because this is a physical job, right? Our brains also need the same strength, flexibility, and endurance because this is, this is the long game. We're going to be in Columbus, Ohio. Our paramedics are on the trucks for 20 years. And so we need to go the long game. So if we think about mental fitness, like we think about physical fitness and that we need a daily practice of mental fitness, just like a daily practice of physical fitness, that makes us better prepared. So when this, when this case study comes at us, this pediatric trauma arrest comes at us, we're ready. Um, it makes us stronger. It makes us better. It gives us a tactical edge if we have a develop a daily practice. So that's um, there's a lot in there that I just threw at you. <laughs> that's why it's mental fitness. Yeah, and I, I got a great you know being around Dave and watching Dave and learning from Dave. Uh, you know, from uh, meditation to uh, uh, just sitting down or having uh, daily devotions, whatever it is you have, I, I think that all plays a role in mental fitness along with, uh, you know, it, it, it also goes back to what we put in our bodies, right? Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I think as a leader, as an officer, you know, or a co-worker saying, hey, why why is that person getting to go in and, and sit down on a, a lazy boy? Well, you know, it, that's a good thing. Let, let them, maybe it's a person that's been on the truck all day or, you know, it's mid afternoon. And, and that's some of the things that we can see issues within the fire service and the EMS uh, services is, you know, we got to be on our feet. We're not allowed sitting down. We can't go, you can't go lay down. You can't do this. And, and those are stiff rules. Cause you know, some of the people like to see busy work uh, and I'm not, you know, in no disrespect to uh, any of the leaders out there, but 10 minutes, I'm just letting some and us identify that. Hey, uh, I've been, you know, back in the office, take care of payroll, doing office stuff and, and taking a couple of runs. But I've, you've had like six runs in a row. I need you, you know, just take a break. Just just take that break. And I think that that's that mental fitness, too, is just, hey, you need a break. Or, or I know for our folks, we have no hesitation and they know it's a rule. If you need to uh, get off the truck for an hour. Well, I'll flip flop somebody over, take, you know, you go sit on the medic. Maybe the person wants to go work out. Hey, you go work out because that's your release. Um, but I think you, you got to know your people intimately. And I think that's part of that mental fitness. But I think one of the biggest things for Dave that he's taught me is also if I don't take care of myself and understand how to do that, then I'll never be able to do it for the people around me when one, either it's just daily work. Or, or small incidents that gather up to, to the bigger picture of addiction and, and some issues they have over periods of time. Or like he said, the big T, right? The big trauma run, the big incident that uh, triggers us. He has taught me uh, so many things about how, how to talk, what to listen to, and, and how to start that approach. So um, I think that's mental fitness too, is, is learning, is learning how to do this. Yeah, so uh, just like physical fitness requires daily work and daily practice at the gym, it also requires rest and recovery, right? So our brains need rest and recovery. So that's why our schedule is one day on and two days off. And I see a lot of firefighters working jobs on their days off. Your brain needs rest sometimes. And uh, so it's all about balance. Um, so just using that physical fitness model, again, if I want to get better at my mile and a half run, I can't go out to the track and run once a week and expect to get better. I have to go out there every day and run and then do some stretching and then do some uh, strength training as well. And I will improve my mile and a half run. So for my mind, what does that look like? Well, the workouts for me look like perhaps daily meditation. That helps me uh, be present in the moment. It's really calming and relaxing So daily meditation daily gratitude and we're, I'm so thankful for, for many things. So just use gratitude, but I have to be intentional. Like if I'm not thinking about it, it's not there for me. Hmm. So every day, what am I thankful for? And then, um, in physical fitness. So it's it, what's good for the body is good for the mind and, and the other way around. So I have a regular exercise routine. I have meditation. And I have gratitude. That's my daily practice for mental health. 
That's excellent. Thank you. Um, we're getting near the end here, but, um, you know, we talked about these phases and, um, you, you know, you walked us through maybe those first six days after the event. Um, what do you do in the weeks following or the months following? Is, is, is there chronic monitoring and um, are there any interventions that occur, you know, weeks to months after the big T? I can't think of any formally. And actually, we're pretty good in the fire service about recognizing those giant uh, critical incidents because they punch you in the gut right away. I think what gets less acknowledgement is the smaller minor runs that build up slowly over time, like the slow burn. And I think what could be done uh, in the long game for that is keeping an eye on each other, looking left and right, who's sitting beside you and go, is that guy running right? And if he's not, if, or she's not, have the be vulnerable and say, hey, are you okay? How's everything going? And lift the hood and see what's going on for that person. You know, give them a safe space to share. I think that's the important thing to, you know, down the road after after the event. Thank you. Yeah, and, and in our, you know, in my sp position specifically, you know, it may be a coworker coming and saying, you know, hey, I, I think there may be some problems with, you know, so-and-so. Um, and it's, you could blow that off. And, and I, for me, it is having that hard, you got, you know, hey, let's get you some help. Hey, you know, some other, you know, some of the crew members are just feeling that, you know, something's going on. You're not your norm. I notice you're not your norm. Um, is there something that we can talk about? Let's just, you know, can we just get together and talk? I'd really appreciate it. But then also the biggest thing is seeing, hey, there these are bigger resources than what, uh, they go way beyond what I'm able to do or what maybe anybody in my department's able to do. And I think especially uh, uh, as a manager, it's your job to know those resources. It is. Uh, I, I think a lot of times EAP, uh, there's some really good EAPs and then there's some really weak e EAPs. Um, so I, I think having maybe some other resources and knowing those other resources that are in our trade, that, that know our job and know what kind of things we go through. Um, and, and I know that that's where I've pointed several of my folks and they've gone and, and then we've had successful results. And, and then when they come back, I here's one thing that we don't talk a lot about. When those folks are coming back and entering the workplace, bring somebody in to talk to your crew. They are the most important people right now that don't know how to act and don't know how to talk and be around the person who has just left for 30, 45, maybe even, you know, a, a longer period of time. And it was paramount for us. And, and we brought in a couple of folks from Columbus to sit down and talk with a crew uh, before a, a gentleman came back from over 12 months. And, and it was paramount for them to know how to how to discuss and, and integrate this person back into your team. That's a big picture that we definitely forget is our own crew besides the individual. Thank you, Captain. Yeah, good stuff, Rob. I'd like to give you both an opportunity to provide our listeners with some closing thoughts or take home points. Captain Cloud, we'll start with you and then we'll end with Lieutenant. Um, I, I really appreciate this time we got to spend. Um, my, my closing thought is just, you know, just take care of each other, take care of yourself. If you can't do that and you don't have those resources, by all means, uh, reach out to the people that do. Uh, you know, Ohio Health has wonderful resources. Columbus Fire has incredible resources. Countywide systems have resources. The main thing is, is have the courage to stand up and help somebody in their time of need. Uh, my own personal uh, experiences of loved ones and, and loss of life because, because of addiction or suicide is very close. And, and I too felt like if I could have done something more and, and now I know I could have, I, I, I do know I could have, if I would only known what I know now back then, I, I just, you know, certainly still weighs heavy on, could I have made that difference? So please don't be in that seat, you know, uh, know that there's, there's people out there that care. And more than anybody, everybody knows me. So, uh, you know, people that do know me, I, I'm sorry. I love to have fun. <laughs> Just have fun. 
hundred <laughs> percent. Right. So I would say, uh, wow, look left, look right, take care of other people around you, uh, be an advocate for, for yourself and for your crew member, develop a daily practice of, of mental fitness and, and mental wellness. Go out and have fun. Super important. Stay curious. Research things you're interested in, you know, away from fire and EMS. You know, don't your identity, don't don't let the identity of the job bring you down. Like it's okay to not be at work sometimes. So <laughs> go, go smoke some Absolutely. meats, chop, chop some woods, uh, you know, go kayaking, go fishing, ride your bike, do stuff purely for fun and, and play because that will make us better when we do come back to work. Give yourself permission to take a break. Uh, we're doers, we're fixers, we're servants in our community. A lot of us will go home and do scouts, coaching, uh, help at school, help with parenting, all the things, right? Give yourself permission to take a break. You deserve it. Thank you. Those are excellent closing thoughts. And uh, this is really an excellent grand round session. Um, such an important topic. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and providing your knowledge and expertise to our listeners. Um, I'm really grateful for that. And I do feel inspired too. Uh, this was excellent, excellent material. And uh, I have a lot of respect for you guys. So thank you very much. Um, I want to remind our listeners that um, you can get continuing education on our website at Ohio Health uh, EMS.com. Uh, there you can have access to our online material uh, as well as CE information. Um, if you have any questions or comments about this content, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Um, if you have questions for captain or lieutenant, I can get those questions on to them as well. Uh, but thank you uh, for taking the time to listen uh, to this Grand Round Sessions. Happy EMS week. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all.